Welcome to the middle layer of our digestive system journey, lecture two of three. So the first lecture talked about a lot of introductory material, digestive system, and worked away from the lips and the mouth and the teeth and the salivary glands. And now we will continue. We will um, take it down the esophagus to the stomach. And we'll talk about um, physiology in the stomach. And uh, the last lecture, we'll hit the pancreas and then uh, small, large intestine to the end. So that's the plan. All right, so first we're gonna talk about this tube that goes from uh, one end to the other, this digestive tube. Yes, and in fact, it is a hollow tube that develops uh, early on. Yeah, sounds pretty boring, doesn't it? You have a mouth on one end and an anus on the other, and uh, we take uh, material in and some material comes out, and what we want can be absorbed into our bodies. That's the plan. Uh, and if you look at a, a primitive fish like a lamprey, it's pretty much a tube like that. And it takes food in, goes out. And, but of course, we have all these uh, uh, evolutionary adaptations, you know, stomach and, and small intestine, large intestine. We got there's a liver pumping into it and a pancreas pumping into it. So a lot of stuff on the way down. But Let's look at this tube. And if I asked you how long it was, amazingly, it'd be eight meters long. Yeah, how's it? You know, we're not eight meters tall, right? So it, obviously it curves and twists. And five or six meters of that is the small intestine. And the purpose being a lot of surface area for absorption. So it's this long, long tube. And it's small intestine because the diameter is small. The large intestine is a larger diameter, but it's much shorter, it's like a meter and a half. Yeah, and uh, we've already been through, you can see at that eight meters, the mouth is obviously not that far, then when the, the pharynx, your throat, then the esophagus, it travels down and it hits that stomach. And then the food is churned there for hours. And then uh, it's released into this big, big, big small intestine, the, the long, small intestine, lots of surface area for absorption. And then, as I mentioned, the large intestine is going to reclaim water and electrolytes and get the waste ready. And just to show you, you know, uh, looking at comparative anatomy, where we come from, if you look at, here's a more basal fish, a shark, and look, it's pretty much a tube with one bend in it, right? It's got one bend. Can't really, the stomach is not impressive, you know, it looks like one, two, pretty much. They have a little spiral valve that slows the food down a little bit so more absorption can take place. Yeah, you catch the striper, a trout, something like that, and you can look at the guts of it and you can see, oh, it's got a stomach, you know, it's got a little kind of a constriction here. So yeah, the stomach can fill up with food. That's kind of cool. You can kind of hold some food there and let it out. And then you see a lot more curves. So, oh yeah, more surface area, gonna be more absorption. And then you get to our amphibian friends and you have not just intestine, but you can see the small, large intestine. You have some specialization. So what I'm showing you is that as you go from primitive fish to amphibians, you know, reptiles, birds, and mammals, you see more and more complexity. And uh, these last two, birds and mammals, were warm-blooded. We need lots of calories, so we really need to break down that food. We really got to absorb everything. A snake can eat a big rabbit, and it can... Uh, sit there for um, months and digest it because it has such a low metabolism. I study rattlesnakes and uh, they sometimes they eat like three meals a year, you know, if it's a big enough meal. And, uh, but they're very, they're and ectothermic or cold blooded. And so they don't need a lot of energy. We burn so many calories that uh, we need to eat three meals a day, you know, and uh, we need to be able to, to extract all the energy to fire, to fuel our fire, right? And so, yeah, and so you look at a mammal, you see uh, it's really that simple tube. Now it's a nice esophagus, an obvious stomach, the small, and large intestine are quite different. Yeah. And birds, they have a pouch off their uh, esophagus for a crop. You ever seen a, a turkey will go in the field and load up on grain, the crop gets big and they'll go fly up in a tree and they can slowly digest. So it's like pouch here. And then they have a gizzard, you know, cause they don't have teeth, but they'll grind the food in there. All right. All right. So 
you need to know in this whole gut tube from one end to the other, you have these similar four layers. Well, first of all, you guys already know that the, the inner part of the tube is called the lumen. The lumen is of a blood vessel, the lumen of a gut tube, right? It's the opening in the middle. Then the layers are inside is the mucosa. And we'll talk a lot about that. That varies quite a bit. It can be stratified squamous in your esophagus. And then it's columnar for the rest of the way. And so to be clear, the, the mucosa is the inner lining. And um, you can see what kind of epithelial tissue, usually it's columnar big cells here in most of the gut. It also includes a little bit of a connective tissue and then a muscle layer. See that uh, muscularis mucosa? And it's a little bit of muscle around there that when it contracts, it can kind of move the, 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 uh, um, um, the epithelium a little bit. It's a little bit. It's not the big muscle that moves your food, but there's a little muscle layer underneath that epithelial tissue. And all that is the mucosa. And in this case, you can see it has all these fingers. These are called villi, these little fingers for surface area, increased surface area. So we'll talk about that. Below the mucosa is a submucosa. It's this space, it's kind of a area in there and there's glands and blood vessels and nerves, all kinds of things in there. It's, so it's connective tissue between that mucosal layer and the muscle layer on the outside. And there's the muscle layer. And uh, what's interesting in your gut, um, you see the stomach has three layers, but the rest of the gut has two layers. It's got an inner circular layer that goes around the tube. And outside of that's a longitudinal layer that's coming at you right there. And so it allows you in these muscles, you know, the circular layer contracts, it's gonna squeeze that tube. When the longitudinal muscles contract, it's gonna shrink that tube, like an inchworm kind of shrink it down like that. And those together will allow you to churn, you know, and move things along that tube. Smooth muscle, right? You don't control that. And then the outer layer, we call it the serosa. Uh, it's connective tissue on the outside. And we'll see when it's here, like in the intestine, it's, it's a shiny layer, nice and shiny. That's a serous membrane, it's moist. So it can, <clears throat> there's no friction as this tube can move around in your abdominal cavity. All right, so mucosa, submucosa, muscularis layer, and then a serosa on the outside, connective tissue. As an example, here's your esophagus. The food comes down to your stomach. And you can see the mucosa here. This part is uh, stratified squamous, non-keratinized. Yeah, and you can see it kind of looks like a lake with lots of coves in it, but that can stretch out when it fills with, with food that you're swallowing, but it's collapsed, kind of looks like that. And the inside is called the lumen again. Mm -hmm. And submucosa will be the space between the mucosa and then the muscle layer. See all that muscle out there? It's just gonna push the food down. And when you swallow, it's, it's pushing the food down. Sometimes in cartoons, they show like you eat this apple and it like goes like gravity comes down, but you can stand on your head and still push the food against gravity, right? So it's pushing the food. All right. And in this submucosal layer, you can see here, it shows some glands. They're gonna be secreting some mucus out there. So everything slides down in your gullet. All right, so that mucosa, the, the muscle layer, I mean, it gets thicker. Some sphincters, it gets really thick or thinner. Um, uh, but that mucosal, the inner layer is the interesting one. It's, it's in contact with the food or whatever's in it and gonna be uh, swallowed. And so um, the mucosa is gonna be, that layer has to be complete. You can't have any breaks in it because then you could allow uh, foreign material and bacteria in the colon to get into your body, right? So it's gonna protect, it's gonna have immune cells, you know, looking for bad guys, pathogens, yeah. And then um, absorption. So those cells, that's your food, your water, your vitamins, your sugar, everything's gonna be in that tube and you need to absorb it into your bloodstream, don't you? And secretion, right? And a lot of that epithelial cells will be secreting enzymes and, uh, and mucus will be secreted all along the tube, you know, keep things moving. So the mucosal layer, that's gonna be a protective layer. It's gonna be for absorption and secretion. Yeah, and like I say, it's gotta see these tight junctions. I mean, you, you, you can't have gaps. It's gotta be a nice tight epithelial layer so that you, you keep the outside world away from you know, inside your body.
here's a view of small intestine. And when you, you open up the small intestine in a cadaver, it's pretty cool. You, you cut it open, there may be some food in there, you know, but as you feel, it feels like velvet. It looks like velvet, it feels like velvet. And you can see you know, these, these folds in it too, called plica circularis, but I won't ask you that. So you have these folds. And then if you could see, you know, on um, uh, closer up, it kind of looks like velvet because you have these villi. And villi are little fingers that come up and it just increases surface area. And so the epithelial, these columnar cells would be all, you know, all around it. I can't draw them all. All these cells in the villi, these fingers provide more surface area. Just imagine trying to dry yourself off with a nice plush towel with these little fingers and then a sheet, you know, a bare sheet, you know. The plush towel with all these fingers has a lot more surface area to trap that water, doesn't it? So the folds provide more surface area. You can see these big folds. And then the villi, these little fingers that make it look kind of like velvety or like a plush towel, increase surface area. And then on the epithelial cells, there's microscopic little microvilli. So we have these la three different layers to increase surface area. So particularly in your small intestine, you look at that, it's got tons of surface area because here's your food and water. It's kind of like a milkshake consistency going through. You need all the surface area to be able to absorb the good stuff out of the, out of the, uh, what came out of your stomach. All right. So surface area is increased here in the, by folds, by villi and, and microvilli on the cells. So secretions into this too. I mean, it starts with saliva, right? In your mouth, remember that? And then uh, all the way down, there's going to be some mucus cells, whether goblet cells, a single cell, or more complex, bigger glands that have a duct that, that squirt into the tube. And that's going to keep things moving, you know. Um, this is a lot of water to make this mucus all the way down. But remember, your large intestines, your opportunity to take that water back. So saliva, you make liters per day. Uh, gastric juice, liters per day. And so you want to lose liters of fluid. Um, in your waist. And so, so the large intestine takes that fluid back and you can use it again. All right, so these glands, what else? I mean, we talk about single cell glands like these uh, goblet cells that you guys are familiar with. And then um, you can have bigger glands. I mean, huge ones like you know, your liver is this big, your liver, your pancreas. And then uh, submucosal glands will be all kinds of them here that are in the submucosa with little ducts that are gonna squirt into that tube. Absolutely. And, and what else goes in there? I mean, we're gonna see hydrochloric acid in the stomach is pumped out into that tube. So there's cells that make that, we'll talk about that today. And then once that acid gets into the, out of the stomach and the intestine, well, you gotta buffer it. You can't have acid eating away your intestines. So you have bicarbonate ions to neutralize it coming out from the pancreas. And all along the small intestine, those cells are making enzymes to break down sugars, to convert other enzymes to active forms. Uh, cool. And yeah, and antibodies, of course, important too, all along here uh, to prevent, uh, it's one avenue of infection to be through your gut tube, of course. All right, here's a picture of some glands. You guys see all this, these, these are all glands, you know, you're looking at it. They're clear because they're lipids making, you know, uh, mucus, type things. And so you can't maybe not see it here, but there'll be a duct to the surface where it will squirt out. Um, so here's some big glands all the way along. Yeah, all right, we'll talk about these layers. Submucosa, of course, is going to be between the mucosa and the muscle. Indeed, and it uh, has a loose connective tissue, um, a dense irregular, just going different directions to give it some strength. Uh, blood vessels and glands can really fill it up too. Uh, cool. This is a piece of um, small intestine. And uh, just so y'all know where we're at, you know, th these are these villi or fingers. And just, I think you guys understand, because we've seen a lot of histology, when you see these little islands here, these are fingers coming at you that have been, that have been cut this way. All right. Over here, you see the fingers sticking out. Here are some ones coming at you. So there's not islands in the middle of your intestine. These are, you know, with a slice of tissue, they caught the little ends of these fingers. And when I look at the submucosa, it's this layer here between here and here, uh, I see, we call them pyrus patches, but these are big patches of, uh, 
lymphocytes and immune cells. And you can see beautiful muscles right here. So the muscles, right, smooth muscle. So uh, again, you, it's not skeletal muscle. You don't contract your you know, intestine muscles. It happens autonomically. Your brain uh, tells it to go. Um, and we'll see the stomach has an extra layer. It can really uh, squish. But the rest of the tube has a, um, um, the inside is this circular layer, all the way around. And then out here is the longitudinal layer going along the tube, the long way. And those working together will allow you to do this peristalsis or moving the food along and, and crushing the food. And I want to be honest with you, uh, we talked about the heart muscle. It, it looks like it goes around, but actually it's a, it's a it spirals. And so this is going to be the circular muscles, just a really tight spiral. So it looks like it's circular and longitudinal looks like it's long, but it's actually slowly turning around like a, like a helix. So just, just so you know, do you care? Yeah, I think you care. You should care. All right, a little table that comes from your book to help you out. Mucosa, submucosa, muscle, serosa. So this tube is uh, innervated um, uh, autonomically. Uh, and you should know what uh, nerve, a cranial nerve, is going to stimulate your gut. Which number? Seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. Yeah, that vagus nerve is parasympathetic, rest and digest. All right. Um, in terms of the, when you look at the, the tube, there's really uh, two plexuses where the, the, some neurons are. Uh, you're going to see some here in the mucosal layer and then a bunch out here between the muscles too. So we'll call it the submucosal plexus. And that's going to be directing the mucosa, you know, like how much do you, juices do you secrete out, a little bit of movement, remember that, a little bit of muscle in the mucosal layer. And the myenteric, myo muscle, is going to control the muscles contracting, you know, they're going to move the, the contents. And remember, vagus nerve, number 10, is parasympathetic, and it's going to increase secretions and muscle activity. Now, fight or flight, sympathetic adrenaline is going to inhibit digestion. Yes. And so why does mom say don't go swimming right after a meal? It's because you can't really digest and, you know, uh, run away, run or do exercise at the same time because, you know, you want to rest and digest after eating and then you want to uh, not be fight or flight when you're trying to digest, you'll get a stomach ache. I mean, it's not gonna kill you, but you know, it's gonna be uncomfortable. In this, of course, I always show you some histology. Here you can see this, these, these big cells or these neurons that'll be right in the muscle layer. It's the myenteric plexus. So that's controlling the muscle. And then, you know, nerves will come down from your brain. All right, so this too, beautiful picture here. Look, I'm looking here, you know, everything going, we'll talk about the, the mouth. Well, we'll talk about swallowing here pretty soon. Look at the pharynx. And the first like third of the esophagus, this is all skeletal muscle. So you control that. But everything here is gonna be smooth muscle. So we're gonna see, we, we start that reflex of swallowing in the back of our throat, esophagus a little bit, skeletal muscle, but then smooth muscle. And at the very end, you'll have skeletal muscle, the anal sphincter, the external one you control too. So you control the two ends, it's smooth muscle in between. And these muscular movements, you should know what peristalsis is. Peristalsis are these waves of contraction that will, that will propel the food forward. So you eat a meal, it's got, you want to take it your time through this digestive system until it reaches the waist at the other end, right? And then there's one exception to these two layers of muscles is the stomach has a third oblique layer. So it has a circular, a longitudinal, and an oblique layer at an angle. So the stomach is just more able to churn and contract, right? Your esophagus is pretty much moving stuff down or if you vomit up. And then the intestines will be able to move things down. The intestines also will squeeze like this, like it will kind of mix. And so it's gonna take this 
milkshake slurry of your food and liquid, and it will help mix it with the enzymes and, and, and expose it to the, uh, uh, the, the surface area so you can have absorption. And we'll talk about that. And then along this gut tube, you have sphincters, which are really just powerful muscle that has the ability to shut off the tube at that point or close it quite a bit. All right. So um, the circular muscle layer just gets really thick in certain areas and acts as a sphincter. Um, you have an upper esophageal sphincter that's usually closed when you're breathing, you're not eating, and it's going to relax and allow, to allow food to come down. And then importantly here is this lower esophageal sphincter. That's between the esophagus and the stomach. So we'll talk about this with heartburn. But that lower one stays closed, so your stomach acid stays in the stomach. You know, even if you lay down, you know, you want to be, you don't want that stomach acid to reflux back up. So upper and lower esophageal sphincter. And this is showing this lower esophageal sphincter here. And it's also called the cardiac sphincter because it's right heartburn, it's right above the heart. Pretty close. Yeah, because remember the heart's going to be right on the diaphragm here. And then a big powerful sphincter is this pyloric sphincter. And pylorus, yes, is the gatekeeper of hell. Yeah, and so imagine the intestines are your hell, right? And this is the gatekeeper. And this pyloric sphincter is, is wicked strong and it closes off completely. And then as the stomach uh, starts mixing and you turn it into this like slurry, this milkshake consistency. And then occasionally that pyloric sphincter will open and just let out like five to 15 mill milliliters. So a little bit will squirt into and then it'll close. And so your stomach will slowly open. This pyloric sphincter will open and close there. Yeah. And uh, in some uh, babies, they're born where the sphincter is too closed. And so they can never, they're, they're always vomiting. They can't um, you know, the, the, their milk, it, you know, it can't continue on. So they need surgery to, to cut that and, and loosen that up. All right. And then, so the pyloric sphincter is between the stomach and the small intestine. Then we go all the way down the five or six meters of the small intestine. And the small intestine eventually will lead into the large intestine, into your colon. And you want the food to go from the small intestine to the large. There's lots of bacteria in there. You don't want to go backwards. You don't want the bacteria and the large intestine material to start going back up, right? So there is an ileocecal valve. And this colon, the first part of the large intestine has a cecum. The cecum is this dead end sac at the end. And so we call this valve the ileocecal. It's more like a flap. It's kind of like a flap. And so that when pressure builds in the large intestine, it kind of automatically closes. So it's not a strong muscle, but it's a flap that keeps this watery fluid going into your colon and not going back out. And it comes in like really watery, like a milkshake. And then your large intestine will take that water back and compress it into a fecal material. And at the very end of the sphincter, the anal sphincters. And um, just like, remember our urethra for, for peeing, for urinating? We had an internal urethral sphincter, and that's smooth muscle. You don't control that. But then you have an external urethral sphincter, and that's what you can control. Your cerebrum can say, I'm not peeing here. I'm going to hold that sphincter closed, the, the, the external. It's the same thing here in the anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle, and you don't control that. You see, it's part of the, if you look at it here, it's part of the wall of the colon, which is uh, smooth muscle, that circular muscle. So you don't control it. But then the external anal sphincter is, is muscle. It's kind of part of the pelvic floor muscle. It gets really thick around the, the, the anus. And that you control, you're able to keep that anal sphincter closed um, because it's skeletal muscle you control. So same thing. The, the rectum, you see, will fill with feces and distend. And then that smooth muscle will relax. But you can control that, that, that external sphincter because it's skeletal muscle. All right, so that's sphincters. We have pyloric, ileocecal, we had upper and lower esophageal, and then anal sphincter. All right, the outer layer of this tube, and if you look at this, uh, this fresh intestine here, you can see it's shiny. And this is what a, um, a theme that goes through this whole semester is that your organs have a, like a saran wrap, a shiny layer on them, and there's a layer on the cavity, right? We did this with the heart, we did this with the lungs. 
Now we get into your abdominal cavity and we'll see the same thing. And we call it the peritoneum. So in the lungs, we had the visceral and parietal pleura. Down your abdominal cavity, we're gonna have a visceral peritoneum, which will be on your intestines, on your stomach. And then a parietal peritoneum, which will align underneath your abs all the way around. So you get it? Same thing. We're calling it visceral and parietal peritoneum now instead of visceral and parietal pleura as we did in the lungs. Yeah, and so it's shiny, um, allows things to move around nicely. Um, if you remember, the kidneys were retroperitoneal. So the kidneys were actually behind this. They, were, they weren't covered by uh, visceral peritoneum. They're behind it uh, just to bring things back. And when you look at the organs like the intestine, all these things, this, there's a fold of that, that visceral peritoneum that comes together and it's called the mesenteries. And so this is your intestines. They're hung by this mesentery against your, off your back wall. And normally we walk upright, so it's kind of weird. Our guts slouch down. Like your cat or a horse or something like that, they hang down like this, right? But us, you know, since we stand upright, they, they go down like that. But, um, but, uh, but our organs like this that are, that are in that um, uh, uh, abdominal cavity, the, um, that serosal layer, which again, gross anatomy is called the uh, visceral peritoneum. It's going to be attached by the, the membranes come together and then it goes around the outside. So it's the same theme we had in the heart and the lungs is that you end up with a sheet and then the, the, the guts or the organ pushes into that sheet and takes it with it and your left is connected to that back wall. We call that the mesentery. And through that runs the blood vessels, the nerves, the lymphatics. All right. So you cut someone open, you look at their abdominal cavity, you pull the intestines around, they're connected to the back wall by this mesentery. And it's made of that shiny layer. So it's gonna be a double layer that connects in the back and connects and it carries all the, uh, the blood and everything else. Blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, uh, you notice when you open a body, not that you guys do that a lot, but hanging off the stomach, you have this uh, mesentery, it's called the greater omentum. Uh, I think it looks like a corn chip, but anyway, it's just this mesentery. It's like an apron that, that folds and it holds a lot of fat. So there's a lot of fat in this, this greater momentum. All right, you guys are doing good. I assume I'm doing okay here. So hopefully you guys are following along. And let's look at these movements. Talk a little bit about that. So this is peristalsis is where you have in this animation, the food is moving down. And um, honestly, it's, it's that, 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 that bolus of food, that, that ball of food that's coming down. By, by It stretches the tube and in front of the tube, it relaxes and behind it, it squeezes. It's just like this reflex that smooth muscle does. And it's gonna move the food down. So peristalsis, as the food is moving down this tube, it's gonna relax the muscle in front, it's gonna constrict in the back and the food is pushed forward. That's generally peristalsis. There's also this um, mixing, we call it segmentation. So if you look at this um, diagram here, you can see the red and the yellow for different uh, parts of the tube food. And if you just squeeze, so it's, there's no actually net movement, but you're just doing this segmentation and it's gonna help mix the food and the juices and the enzymes for digestion. So peristalsis, you're going somewhere. In segmentation, you're just mixing things up. Oh, this is kind of gross. Um, this is an egg, my music is terrible. This is an endoscope that uh, goes down this nice clean stomach. But take a look at the movement in the stomach. This is these waves of uh, peristalsis move in your stomach slowly. That's gonna mix the food in there. There you go. Here comes another one. Music was a little much, but uh, you see that nice clean stomach in there, and uh, we see these waves that move down. 
and we'll see after you you eat the the you know the waves are more 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 uh, more often and uh, you can feel your stomach growling you know uh, when it's when it's hungry you start those uh, movements happening and anticipation all right so uh, let's step back and so our food is in our mouth we chew it mastication as you chew your food then you're going to go to swallow it we'll see i'll show you next the tongue is going to push it back and you begin swallowing so the pharynx is the tube, is the area, the throat behind the oral cavity. And so the tongue is going to push the bolus or ball of food backwards. And then this is a view, strange view, but we're looking from the back of the head. We're looking at the back of the head if you, you took away all the muscles and everything in the vertebrae. And you can see the back of the throat here. And you have these pharynx muscles. They're called constrictors, like a superior, middle, inferior. And they are going to, when they squeeze, they're going to cause that food to go down to the esophagus. Now, it could pop up, but your soft palate and the uvula will close that door so it doesn't go up in your nasal cavity. So when you squeeze these pharyngeal muscles back here, the food only has one place to go, and that's down. And you relax the esophagus, and the food's going to head that direction. And remember, so just review, we learned this, but the pharynx, the nasal pharynx, is, it will be up here. Um, and then the oral pharynx, we're going to talk, talk about now, the back behind your oral cavity, and the laryngeopharynx. So this huge tongue, you see this picture is going to, when you're done chewing your food, the tongue is going to go up against the palate, and it's going to force that food backwards. And once it hits that oral pharynx, it's skeletal muscle, but it's a reflex that's going to cause you to swallow. So swallowing is called deglutination. It's also another word for it. Um, but let's take a look. We start here at this one and you see, yeah, there's your food. You take your time, you add saliva, you chew it up. And then when you're ready to swallow, your tongue just forces it backwards. And then the soft palate is going to close, isn't it? So you're going to close the nasal cavity so food doesn't go up into your nasal cavity. And it's only got one way to, way to go, and that's downward. And then at the same time, if you watch someone swallowing, your, their Adam's apple is going to rise. And so your larynx is going to rise, your hyoid is going to rise, and that epiglottis is going to cover your windpipe, your glottis, down to your larynx. So your windpipe is closed, and that epiglottis is kind of smooth on the top, and that bolus of food is going to slide over it. And then you relax those lower constrictors so there's rooms, and you constrict the upper constrictor so that the food is pushed downward. It slides over the epiglottis, avoiding your windpipe. And then um, your esophagus is relaxed, that sphincter, and the food enters the esophagus. And then once it enters the esophagus, is a reflex where it starts squeezing so that it moves the food down. And I'll show you a cool radiograph of swallowing something. All right, what do you think? Chew, chew, chew. Bolus of food is pushed back by the tongue. You want to close your, your soft palate to close the nasal cavity. Your larynx is going to rise. Your epiglottis is going to cover your glottis. The food is going to be pushed over the epiglottis and the top of it. And the only place it can go is the esophagus because you've relaxed it. That food is going to go in that esophagus and the esophagus will start squeezing. It'll take over and it will move it down. We can take a look at this. It doesn't have any horrible music, um, but they're swallowing radio op uh, opaque fluids. You can see the swallowing process. Some kind of food, I guess, that liquid here. Ah, you see that? Ah, oh, you can see the hyoid bone. You can see the larynx, the esophagus behind it, and there's some food. Seems to be caught some of that in there. Here we go. Here's the fluid. Look at that. Ah, see how quickly that happened? Oh, they're wearing glasses too. That's cool. So they, they video off. recording. But you're getting a lot of x rays of this doing this um, x ray uh, exposure. Oh, uh, wait, we'll show you one from the, from the, from the front. Here we go. Yeah, we're seeing it go through the esophagus. It's got a little bend to it there. Can I follow it down, please? And you'll be able to follow it down. You see the heart behind the heart? Okay, video off. Recording. 
and back out. Up, up, up. Are you off? There we go. Video off. Oh, I think I gave you a kind of a, a cool picture looking at that. And so you saw um, that uh, liquid going through the neck region and then going behind the heart, behind the lungs. And uh, yeah, cool. All right, so this is just in words here, but um, you are uh, chewing and mixing the food with saliva. And then when you begin swallowing, you use your tongue to push that food backwards. And that's gonna begin this reflex that you have. It's gonna be in the pharynx, and it's gonna be pushed down the esophagus and the esophagus will push it down. All right. And when you swallow, you stop breathing too. So your breathing's inhibited. And then once you swallow, you start breathing again. All right, so this esophagus, it goes from the, um, your pharynx and it's gonna go through that diaphragm through a hole in it and it's gonna go into the stomach. And remember, you have an upper esophageal sphincter and a lower esophageal sphincter that are normally closed unless you're swallowing and things are going through it. The esophagus, the, uh, the top third is gonna be is this skeletal muscle and then the lower third is all um, uh, smooth. And then honestly, it's, it's a kind of a mix in the middle. So you kind of control that beginning swallowing process and then transition to the smooth as you go down. It's lined with stratified squamous because you're swallowing things that are potentially sharp. And so you want to be able to have friction along that tube as it, as it goes down to your stomach. And I'll show you, here's the first issue, a pathology that can happen. And uh, I see this often in cadavers. Um, is what you'll see is that esophagus has to go through a hole in the diaphragm, a hiatus or hole. And um, if um, that hole is loose in some way, your stomach can actually slide up like behind your heart and into your lung, lung cavity. So um, it's called a hiatal hernia. And there's many kinds of hernias talked about reproductive and the inguinal hernias when intestines go down into the, the scrotum it could go that direction. Um, you have a hernia out your belly button if there's a weakening there. And a hiatal hernia is if a piece of gut goes up through this hiatus in the diaphragm. Yep, and this one slides, which means it goes up and down. People will lay down, it'll be uncomfortable when they sit up, it'll, it'll, it'll slide back down. And here you're looking at a dissection, you can see here's a piece of uh, stomach that, that comes up here. So if there's a weakening in the diaphragm and I've seen um, these uh, plastic like a donut and it's been sewed in there. And then this is kind of a mesh, but that'll prevent that, that, that uh, hiatal hernia from sliding up and down. So very common surgery there. All right, so this esophagus is stratified squamous. And then as soon as it hits the stomach, you're gonna get columnar cells making lots of mucus. And so it's pretty dramatic, this junction between your stomach and your esophagus where the esophagus dumps into it. It's actually a tricky area too. People can get heartburn. You could have this, this thing called Bartlett's esophagus. There's a, there's a lot of blood vessels there. You can have esophageal bleed that can kill you. Um, so this region where esophagus turns into stomach, you can see it's a, it's a dramatic, uh, uh, change there. So our stomach is a big sack that can store food. So you guys can go to the buffet, load up your stomach, go home, lay on a hammock, and then take hours to digest. And that, you know, a lion can have, I shouldn't, I don't know, 20, 30 pounds of meat, and then it can go off. And in our stomach, we fill it up, and then uh, it, it it takes hours as it's in the stomach and then you slowly empty it out. So we'll look at the anatomy of the stomach. Um, everyone's stomach's a little different. You look at cadaver stomachs, but generally it's this shape, just like that, kind of like a, kinda like a J. Um, holds about a liter, it can hold more than a liter. Um, and then it's right beneath the diaphragm. It's on the left-hand side, right under your rib cage. So people, kids especially, where's your stomach? And they, they point down to their intestines. It's actually higher than that higher and on the left side. Your liver's on the right, your stomach's on the left. 
And remember, it has three layers of muscle, so it's powerfully, it's gonna churn and mechanically break up your food. Oh yeah, eating contests is a, is a sport. Um, and it's not always the big, huge uh, men and women that win it. Uh, it's just about how big can your stomach uh, extend. Uh, what do I want you to know for stomach anatomy? All right, there's different regions of the stomach. Well, first of all, this is the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. How's that? And then here you can see this is where the esophagus comes down. And so there's gonna be a, a lower esophageal sphincter that's gonna keep your stomach acid from going back up the esophagus. And then the big powerful pyloric sphincter, that's the gateway between the stomach and your intestines. There's these uh, rugae or folds in here that uh, disappear when the stomach is extended. But when it's collapsed, you see these folds appear. And then in terms of regions of the stomach, you need to know this top part is called the fundus. You have that in the bladder too. And then the body makes up most of it. And then the pyloric region is by the pyloric sphincter. I guess I'll be complete with you. We call this region right here, the very beginning, the cardiac region, as we get heartburn. Yeah, and in histology class, when I taught that, we, we looked at stomach histology from each of these sections. You see how they differ a little bit. And us, pretty much, you know, the body makes up most of the stomach. And the fundus on top is where air, get, when you swallow air, to burp, you know, get rid of that, that, that air on top. And here's a radiograph, and uh, you can see the fundus on top. All right, so the stomach. And when you take a look at the stomach, you'll see it looks very thick and very, um, well, it has these folds in it, but you can tell the epithelium is very thick because it's secreting tons of juices, acids, right? This enzyme, yeah. So let's see what it secretes. Let's talk about the chemistry here a little bit. Hydrochloric acid. I'll show you, uh, I put in a little video here, kind of explains how you make the acid. Um, yeah, so your stomach is super acidic. And then the enzyme that's important to know is called pepsin. And pepsin breaks proteins. It's really good at a lot of different proteins, breaking those bonds. All right, now, and pepsin is made by chief cells. And if I wanna be honest with you guys, how I remember that, is I'm a big Kansas City Chiefs fan. Imagine a chief holding a Pepsi. So I think Chiefs, pepsin, and then parietal cells make the acid. And I got no good way to put acid and parietal together. So I remember Chiefs cells, Pepsi, so all right. And um, if you make pepsin, pepsin breaks down all kinds of proteins, right? Well, think how dangerous that is to make in a cell made of proteins, right? It's like making matches in a, in a paper house, right? It's just so dangerous, right? So you don't make pepsin per se, you make pepsinogen. And pepsinogen is pepsin with a safety cap on it. It's a precursor to pepsin. So pepsinogen is made perfectly safe. It doesn't eat up your cells as they make them. And then when pepsinogen gets in an acid environment, the safety cap comes off, then it's pepsin. And it can break down the proteins in your food. It breaks down the stomach lining too. So you have lots of mucus that kind of protects it but you're always like making new stomach cells because that pepsin just breaks down any protein it finds. Cool. And as I mentioned, you make lots of mucus. So it's, uh, mucus is gonna protect the cells and the epithelium of the inside of your stomach because it's so acidic in there that pepsin is so corrosive to proteins that you make lots of mucus that protects the stomach wall as best it can. But you always are making new cells in the stomach epithelium because you keep digesting them but you keep mucus helps, you know, uh, protect. And then you should also know, this is gonna be important for the last chapter is that uh, in order to uh, absorb vitamin B12, which you need, it makes something called intrinsic factor. So stomach cells make um, um, uh, intrinsic factor. And all you need to know is that you have to make intrinsic, vendor, intrinsic factor in the stomach and it goes down to the intestine and allows you to absorb vitamin B12. When we see vitamin B12 deficiency, it's usually not because you're not getting enough in your diet, it's because you have a problem because your stomach's not making intrinsic factor. Or why when you get a, a gastric surgery, why you can't remove the whole stomach, 
because you need to make that intrinsic factor if you want to be able to absorb B12. Anyway. Yeah, and you do make um, a gastric lipase, breaking down lipids or fats, but it's a weird thing. You make it, but it doesn't work well in acidic conditions. So what the hell is it doing in your stomach, right? It's, and so it's kind of, a, we, we developed this real acidic stomach and I, I think gastric lipase is kind of a throwback. It was more important when we have a less acidic stomach, but it can take over. It can, it can if you, um, uh, it can break down fats. Uh, it can take over more if you have a problem downstream breaking down fats, but you make some gastric lipase. But uh, when you think stomach, think hydrochloric acid and pepsin to break down proteins. And then it has a minor role breaking down fats. Um, yeah, I just, I can't, I got to mention uh, this guy, William Beaumont. He was uh, uh, born in Connecticut, lived in New York, and he uh, was an army surgeon. So he was an army surgeon, talking about 1800s. Um, and then um, he happened to get this guy, he worked for the, uh, the what is it, the fur, uh, Mackinac Island, the, the fur company, the big fur company, you know, you think about your history back then. Anyway, but he, he got shot accidentally in his stomach with buckshot. He made a big hole, he thought he was gonna die, and this guy kind of, a doctor brought him back. Uh, he survived, but he had a fistula or a hole in his stomach always. It wouldn't heal over. So Beaumont thought, ah, this is a great opportunity to study digestion. And so this guy, he couldn't work fur trapping anymore. So he hired him as a, as a handyman and uh, he did all these experiments on him. He would uh, um, take uh, like a little bit of chicken wing and they would shove it in that hole with a string and he'd wait an hour and he'd pull it out and then take wait another hour and he saw the digestion taking place. And he did other experiments too. He would take some juice out and then pr uh, prove that it could uh, digest food. So back then we thought it had to be like the crushing of the stomach. We said, oh no, it's, it's just chemical digestion. Yeah, and different uh, temperatures and, and different emotions. So he, he did a bunch of experiments and really, you know, the, the, the father of uh, digestive physiology is this Beaumont guy. Yeah. Eventually, um, um, I remember the doctor, I remember the, I don't remember the guy's name that he um, um, that was did all these experiments on, but uh, he did get better. He kind of uh, escaped and Beaumont kind of chased him down and wanted to keep doing experiments with him. So it's a little bit of interest, interesting history there. All right, let's talk stomach and digestion. Look at how thick it is. Just look at how thick the mucosa is. And it's, uh, can you see these little tiny, how's your resolution? It's better over here. These are all these mucus cells. And then you have these pits, see these holes? And they go deep in this mucosa. So you're making liters of juice in the stomach. Ah, oh, beautiful view. You can see kind of that cobwebby mucus on it. Then you see those holes. These would be these gastric pits that go deep in there to these glands. And the glands, sometimes they branch, sometimes they're just long and squiggly. But the deal is you can make lots of juice. And if you could see this in real time, the juice would be you know, squirting out of these pits. And you make so much because they go deep in there. And so all of these cells are making acids and mucus and uh, the pepsinogen and they're being squirted out into the food. So yes, and then for your practical, you'll be able to recognize this is stomach epithelium. Um, and uh, all of this is just all these tubes of these glands. Yep, so the pits are on top and these deep glands and these cells lining it will be chief cells and parietal cells and mucus cells that are making product juices that will be uh, squirted up. All right, and so this juice, again, pepsinogen, turns into pepsin when it's an acid. And actually pepsin also converts more pepsinogen. So it catalyzes that reaction. And then hydrochloric acid, lots of acid, lots of mucus. And then don't forget intrinsic factor is a chemical that allows you to absorb B12 in your intestines. And um, these juices are secreted always at a slow rate, but then you'll see when you, when you begin, you start thinking about food, you start eating food, then it just steps up and you secrete tons of juice. Um, uh, I'll let you look at this. I don't think I wanna go through it now, um, uh, but you can watch this video on the PowerPoint. It shows how do we make hydrochloric acid? And pretty much, um, I bet you can guess this a little bit. Let's see, oh no. 
Secretion of hydrochloric acid. I don't want to go through that all. Um, but uh, let's see, take a look here. This is op. No. But what happens is that uh, you, um, here's the cell, the parietal cell that's going to make um, uh, hydrochloric acid. And so here's the blood. And you're going to take um, carbon dioxide, which you make in the cell too. And you're going to make carbonic acid. God, this, this equation we use all the time. You make carbonic acid, and then you'll pump out the hydrogen ions. Yeah, and it turns out chlorine will come out too. Chlorine will follow that because it's negatively charged. You pump it in, it follows the hydrogen. So you're making hydrochloric acid. And then the bicarbonate ions, bicarb, they will go back into the blood. So as chlorine comes in, it's negative. Bicarb leaves because it's negative like that. And the bicarbonate will uh, turn into sodium bicarbonate and be carried away. So it's kind of interesting reading your book after a big meal, you have this uh, um, bicarbonate uh, flush, you know, you, you pee it out eventually, but you make a lot of it because you're making acid, bicarbonate's traded for the chlorine. Anyway, so stomach cells make hydrochloric acid and squirt it into the stomach. All right. Well, your stomach epithelium, you can see, oh my God, you renew it every twice to once a week. So it's constantly be eaten away. I mean, that mucus protects it, but not completely. So your stomach is always, always dividing the surface. Um, the deeper glands last much longer. Look at that, those acid and, and pepsinogen producing ones, those can last hundreds of days, all right. So, but they're protected deep in those pits and those glands. The surface cells are eaten away every day. All right, so what is gonna make your stomach secrete more juices? Well, this is gonna be the vagus nerve. And, uh, it's going to come down and it's going to, uh, the nerves are going to cause you, when you have parasympathetic stimulation, it's going to cause you to secrete juices, gastric juices. And then there's cells in the stomach that also secrete a hormone called gastrin. And gastrin is secreted by stomach cells, it goes out in the blood, and gastrin also makes your stomach cells secrete more juice. So there's the direct effect of the nerve acetylcholine, because it's parasympathetic, and then there's going to be gastrin being produced, and that is going to act on the stomach. So both of these are stimulating the stomach to produce juices. And interestingly, here's these uh, parietal cells that make the acid. You would think maybe like the stimulation causes them to make more acid. That would be the, be the easy way to think about it, right? But there's actually cells next to the parietal cells and they're constantly secreting uh, an inhibitory chemical called somatostatin is inhibitory in a lot of places in the body. And so they're constantly making somatostatin, they're whispering in the, the cell's ear, don't make acid, don't make acid. Now the vagus nerve with acetylcholine secreted is going to shut these guys up. And then the acid secreting cells no longer listening to them and it makes more acid. So the acetylcholine from parasympathetic nervous system is going to inhibit the somatostatin that was inhibiting the acid production so that acid production steps up. All right, a little complicated. Then you'll also see important in this is gastrin. Gastrin, remember always gastric, gastric in the stomach is going to make the stomach and make more acid. And histamine too. Histamine is another important chemical that's gonna stimulate uh, more stomach secretions. All right, and I had a video earlier and I, and I decided to, 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 to nix it, but um, your stomach, it has three phases that we talk about in its activity. The cephalic means the head, your head phase. And that is when you even think about food, you smell food and you begin, your stomach starts churning and, and putting out acid. So you're in the line at lunch, you, that's the cephalic phase. You are uh, starting to secrete things. The gastric phase is when that food hits your stomach. And so um, that is gonna stretch the stomach and you're gonna have gastrin released and uh, local reflexes are gonna make your stomach go. And then the stomach will be, will have your food for hours. And then when it hits the intestine, you reach that intestinal phase. 
And when that food starts hitting the intestine, it kind of wakes it up. And it's actually gonna secrete a, a type of gastrin that actually like speeds things up, but then it quickly is gonna inhibit it. So as the stomach is emptying, you're gonna kind of ramp down the stomach production because you're, you want it to uh, um, empty the stomach. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how you can read this, but uh, definitely. So the sight, the thought, the, the smell, the taste of food is going to make the vagus nerve stimulate your stomach to get it going, get it ready for food. Uh, the gastric phase is when the, the stomach is stretching and you're gonna have, again, nervous reflexes and also gastrin is released as hormone that comes back and makes you release more uh, stomach juice, gastric juice. And finally, when it's hitting the intestines, um, there's gonna be a little bit of gastrin that kind of speed things up, but then it's gonna start ramping down your stomach. What can inhibit this? Yeah, depression. You know, when you, when you're, if you, your cerebrum is supposed to make your vagus nerve make you produce uh, stomach acids, but if you're, you're not in the right mood to eat, um, it's the digestion is difficult. It's really interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, emotional upset again. Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah. Um, Listen, that's interesting. Yeah, because I mean, I'm thinking that's that's that's, that's kind of cool. You realize that you got to be in the in the mood to eat, or you got to kind of force yourself. Yeah. And if the stomach acid, the pH gets you know wicked acidic, gets above, I mean below three, it's going to obviously inhibit, so you don't make more stomach acid, right? All right, so does your stomach absorb food and nutrients? Um, it's not really designed for that. It's designed to be secreting acids and juices and to protect the walls is what it's designed for. But I guess you should know you do absorb some water, a little bit of alcohol, a few drugs, but uh, a small amount. And uh, yeah, like you can see the stomach, you saw that, that video, it's going to churn it. And then that pyloric sphincter will slowly let out a little bit at a time. You don't want to open the floodgates and just empty the stomach into the intestine. The intestine, it's that, that fluid is called chyme. And it's like a milkshake. It's filled with whatever you ate and drunk. And then also with um, 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 acid. So it's very acidic, this chyme. It's like an acid milkshake. And uh, you want to let it out slowly into the intestine so the intestines can neutralize that acid and work on it a little bit at a time. And when you drink liquids, I'm not, there's even a, a little groove. Sometimes liquid can kind of take a, a, a shortcut right along that lesser curvature. But uh, when you eat meals, uh, realize that um, fatty foods stay in your stomach longer, all right? And then proteins and carbs. Um, so there's different, depending on your meals, how long uh, it stays within the, the stomach churning. And it will mix it, mix it with the acid and pepsin, break down proteins. And then again, the food is gonna be hitting the intestines out of the stomach and it's acid, it's gonna kind of burn it a little bit. It's gonna stretch it. And um, you have what's called the enterogastric, which means intestine stomach reflex, where um, food hitting the intestine, leaving the stomach is gonna come down and it's gonna have a reflex and it's gonna slow down the churning of your stomach. All right. Vomiting is the opposite of swallowing, right? <clears throat> so know that nausea is a sense that you get, roller coaster or um, um, uh, motion sickness or emotional upset, or if you ate something wrong. But so nausea is this feeling you're gonna throw up and then vomiting is a, is a reflex. And what happens of course is usually take a breath and then you're, your diaphragm will contract, pushing down the guts, your abdominal muscles will contract, so the stomach contents are being compressed, then you wanna relax your esophageal sphincters, and that food, if it's under pressure, will come back up. And you wanna close off your soft palate so that vomit doesn't go up your nose, and it comes out. So that's vomiting, it's an important reflex for us to get rid of if we swallow poisons and things like that, of course. Um, Cows do it for a living, deer, they, they throw up, they chew their cud and they swallow it back and forth. 
Heartburn. Heartburn is not your heart burning, but it feels like it because your heart is right above your esophagus there. And if the sphincter is not strong enough or you eat so much or, and that you produce too much acid and it, and it starts going up, it'll burn. The acid will burn the esophagus and you'll feel that as heartburn. Um, you can see there's many of you out there. Some of you, some of the medications include uh, PP, uh, PPIs, protein pump inhibitors. You make less acid and of course um, antacids you can take which neutralize acid. So there's medication out there for this. Um, but obviously if you eat too much food, you know, you should eat smaller meals. Uh, pregnancy can cause this, pushing on it, smoking, uh, alcohol. Uh, so yeah. Um, try to not eat smaller meals and don't try to gorge yourself because that really will cause the stomach to expand and some of that food will come back up. Yeah. Stomach ache, again, pain in the stomach. Um, um, uh, it also helps not to lay down after you eat because gravity helps, you know, prevent reflux back up there too, doesn't it? And then ulcers. Uh, ulcers were used to be thought were stress making too much acid. And that can contribute to ulcers, but the cause almost always of ulcers is a bacterial infection, Helicobacter pylori. You can read on your, on your book how uh, people did not believe this early on, that it was a bacterial infection that causes ulcers. And so a couple scientists, they, they, they swallowed a bunch of uh, anti, uh, bacterial water and it, it, they got ulcers. That, that's dedication there. So if you have uh, ulcers, uh, almost always you give it antibiotics and because uh, uh, these this bacteria lives in acidic conditions and it will, an ulcer is a hole. So through your duodenum, through your stomach, you know. A ah, beautiful picture here. So here's your stomach. Here's the pyloric sphincter. And then here's the small intestine, right? You see all the little villi for, for absorption. All right, long lecture here. Okay, yes, I know. So we'll, we'll finish off the pancreas much shorter and uh, we'll, we'll be good, all right? So hang on a little bit longer here. So our pancreas we've already talked about, we've looked at in lab in the endocrine system because it has the hormones, insulin and glucagon for blood sugar, right? Most of the pancreas is not involved in that. It's involved with making pancreatic juice for digestion, all right? So the, the exocrine part of it is where it makes juice that runs down a duct that's gonna squirt into your intestines. As soon as that food comes out of your stomach, squirt it with pancreatic juice. Uh, looking at the pancreas, it's a pretty big uh, gland. It sits uh, retroperitoneal, the, stuck to the back wall, and uh, the head of it goes in that loop, of, first loop of the small intestine, the duodenum, as it sits in there, and the tail goes back and it touches the spleen over here. So it's along the back. Pancreatic cancer is a bad one. Um, um, yeah, but the pancreas is making this juice, this watery juice, and it has a long pancreatic duct that comes out and there's a little nubbin in there with a sphincter. And then at the right time, when food comes in, it's squirted with this pancreatic juice. And that little, that little opening, also it shares it, the pancreas and the gallbladder. So yeah, you can see here the green bile from the gallbladder comes down and pancreatic juice comes out. And then there's a, a, a little uh, ampulla, a little swelling and a little muscular sphincter it's called the hepatopancreatic. How easy is that? Hepatopancreatic. Hepatitis, hep hepatic is liver and pancreas. So they share this little sphincter, this little papilla, this little nubbin that you can find when you cut open a body, you look in the duodenum, you'll see this little nubbin, a little, like a little hood, a little hole. And um, when food comes out of the stomach, reaches the small intestine, out squirts this pancreatic juice and bile right onto that, that chyme coming out of the stomach. What's in pancreatic juice? What's not in pancreatic juice, all right? In terms of enzymes, there's enzymes to break down fats, proteins, nucleases, and carbs, everything. So your pancreas, that juice has enzymes to break down everything. Remember in your stomach, we broke down proteins with pepsin and then a little bit of lipase, some lipids, that's all, no carbs. Remember your saliva has amylase to break down carbs. Put this all together because I'll ask you this. 
and your pancreas, once it hits your small intestine, you make something for everything. So what's in pancreatic juice? We have uh, pancreatic amylase. We had salivary amylase in our mouth. So that's gonna break down um, um, starches. And um, um, not only starches, but um, um, a glycogen too. So uh, carbs, break down carbs, yeah. Pancreatic lipase. Lipase is lipids. You break down, so you break down fats with lipase. Amylase breaks down uh, uh, carbs. There's nucleases that break down DNA and RNA. And finally, what about proteins? Well, there's three you got to know. Most important is uh, trypsin. You also make uh, chymotrypsin and carboxypeptidase. It's a mouthful, right? But these are three different enzymes that are going to break down uh, proteins. But I don't know if you guys notice it, but the gen and genesis, the enzyme that breaks down uh, proteins is going to be trypsin. But you make the safe trypsinogen. Just like pepsin in your stomach, you made the safe pepsinogen. So trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, these are safe versions of the enzyme that you make with a safety cap on them. Once they get into the intestines, they'll be converted into trypsin and chymotrypsin. And there's a, a made by your intestinal cells, there's enterokinase is, uh, is made. And when the trypsinogen hits the enterokinase, the safety cap comes off, it's trypsin, it can break down proteins. Yeah. Yep, and there are diseases, you get pancreatitis, when uh, these uh, enzymes, the safety cap comes off too early and they start breaking down the pancreas, the proteins in the pancreas. So you wanna make trypsinogen and you want it to get all the way to the intestine before you make trypsin and there it can break down the proteins. Don't start breaking down proteins in the pancreas because that'll hurt. And then I talk about this, um, about all these enzymes, it's true, but then a big thing that it makes are bicarbonate ions. It makes those to neutralize the acid, the stomach acid, because that chyme is coming out super acidic from the stomach. So bicarbonate ions hit it. They got to neutralize that acid because your intestine's not made to withstand that acid. It's going to stop the pepsin from working because it likes acidic conditions. And it makes it hospitable for the trypsin and everything else. So it makes the right pH. So bicarbonate ions are gonna neutralize that acid and uh, make your intestinal contents more basic. Your stomach wants to be acid. Pepsin works in acidic conditions. These other things work in a basic condition. So, yeah. All right, so pancreatic juice, bicarbonate ions, and then all these different enzymes. All right, so what is gonna make the pancreas um, secrete its uh, um, juices? Well, I told you it was when the food hits the small intestine, it's gonna, that's gonna stimulate, the acid's gonna burn it, it's gonna swell, and it's gonna, you need to be squirting bicarbonate on it, right? Right away, right? So uh, there's a hormone called secretin. And so the intestinal cells will make secretin, that hormone goes in the bloodstream, and it makes the pancreas <clears throat> squirt out those bicarbonate ions. And there's a second enzyme we'll see, I must talk about a bit later called CCK. And that's also gonna make the pancreas secrete. And it also makes your gallbladder. So secretin makes the pancreas secrete its juices. CCK, this cholecystokinin, is going to make the pancreas and the gallbladder secrete. There it is. Watch, press the button. So CCK, we'll call it, makes the pancreas and the gallbladder secrete. So that's the deal. When the intestine gets hit, gets expanded with that food from the stomach, it secretes two hormones, secretin, CCK. Secretin makes the pancreas shoot out juices. CCK makes the pancreas and the gallbladder squirt out their juices and that's gonna hit the food and help you digest. Woo, it's a long one. All right, here we go. Taking a look at this beautiful black and white. I know it's still a beautiful artwork. You can see, and, and I, you think I'm always ignoring that too. Sometimes there's an accessory pancreatic duct, but the point is there's a pancreatic duct and here's that little nubbin. And then the bile duct is gonna reach it. And both of those, there's a little sphincter there that will relax. These things will squeeze and bile and pancreatic juice will squirt onto that chyme that's coming out of the stomach. 
All right, you guys, long lecture, um, but we covered um, what's going on, swallowing, esophagus, stomach, and then the beginning of the intestine there with what the pancreas is doing, all right? So the pancreas you guys should have secretes a lot of enzymes and bicarbonate. The liver, I'll start the lecture in person next. We'll talk about liver making bile, what that's gonna do. And then we'll talk about the small, the large intestine to the outside. All right, you guys, hopefully you took this in chunks and uh, I just lectured on it this long. Hopefully you didn't, you know, maybe you listened to the whole thing, but um, in any case, uh, good luck, read this. Hopefully this is uh, helpful.